Hey folks, uh, about every three months I decide to make a really random video about a case that's really pissing me off or something like that. <laughs> so I'm back with Actual Justice Warrior. The last time I had you on, we talked about Julius Jones. Um, and today we're going to talk about Adnan Syed. Um, and this case, I think that there's a lot more to unpack here than the Julius Jones case, I have to say. Um, and I hate to admit this, I hate to admit this, but I listened to Serial and it was the first podcast that I think I had ever listened to. And I was so convinced of his innocence that I actually gave money to the Innocence Project. I did that. Me. Makes me hate myself. But it was 2016. It's 2022. Uh, and now that I've seen the other side of this case, man, I really believe the Innocence Project has done more harm than good <laughs> at this point. Um, so we're here to talk about that and Heyman Lee's murder. Um, I'm just so outraged that he has been painted as innocent. Everybody's forgotten about Heyman Lee. And, um, this has become this woke example of Islamophobia, even though in this process, they've totally smeared the Korean community and the Muslim community has, has, um, also framed a black guy, <laughs> Jay, who I don't think had any involvement outside of, um, burying the body. So we're going to talk about that too. So I, I think the best way, because this is such a multifaceted case, I think the best way to unpack this is to um, kind of go through the facts of the case. So for anybody that's unfamiliar with this case, could you give a little bit of a broad outline? Oh, so on January 13th, 1999, Heyman Lee goes missing from her school. She attended her classes. So the timeline of her being missing is around 2.15, where the last person known to us to have seen her saw her um her body is not discovered for six weeks she ultimately ended up being killed that day it is a death via strangulation and adnan saeed the ex-boyfriend who like Heyman started dating somebody else 13 days before so like the ex-boyfriend and that was his major girlfriend is arrested as the suspect the case is built largely on the testimony of jay wilds who gives the cops information that only somebody involved in the crime would know and the information relates to the burial, and then it's all supplemented by cell phone records. And this leads to basically one of the easiest trials for the prosecution that you could have. Right, the right. jury convicted him in two hours. And this takes place are in the Baltimore area. Like I, they were at like a magnet school. So it's not mm -hmm. maybe not in the city proper, but it's it's investigated by the Baltimore PD because of the fact that the body was dumped where all these like gangbangers would dump their dead bodies after they kill them. So like it's, it's, it's painted by the, by the free add on side as a story of a corrupt Baltimore police force and Islamophobia and all these other things. Mm -hmm. But the basics are Heyman Lee was killed, find her body six weeks later, witness testimony combined with cell phone evidence, uh, convicts add on then appeals. Right, right. So I think that the um, the Syed supporters they focus so much on Jay's story and and what and how Jay changed his story. But but he had priors and he didn't want to have any interaction with the police and he had a lot of incentives to kind of downplay his role in this. And so they're like, well, he said initially that he didn't help bury the body, and then then he said that that he did. But then in all of these um propaganda documentaries about Syed, they they totally leave out that Syed had a series of alibis that he changed. And as they would be confronted one by one with new evidence, he would just be like, oh, well, that's not true. So this is what actually happened. So do you want to go through a few <laughs> a few of the alibis that he had and why they fell apart and um, and their genesis over time? So um, it's it's really interesting because in the serial documentary, you actually hear Adnan go through these bad alibis, but they um in the podcast, but they do them in episode one. So by the time you get all the like nonsense, that's like this guy's clearly guilty, and then they go through them all, yeah. all the reasons why he's innocent. So you come away thinking he's innocent, but then you realize that his alibi makes no sense. Right. So Adnan claims that he asked Heyman Lee for a ride. This is what he said to the police that day when they called him after Heyman Lee was presumably already killed by Adnan. Now, right. this is a devastating admission because essentially that makes him the last person to see her alive and likely the killer. So he's changed that over the years, claiming that he didn't ask her for a ride. And the reason he didn't have his car was because he actually drove to hang out with Jay because he wanted to make sure Jay got his own girlfriend, Jay's girlfriend, a birthday present. Like but he would like, give a crap. Why would he care? Yeah, it was really weird. And the way he describes it, it's it's amazing. Like when I heard it where he said, 
I talked to Jay's girlfriend and she said, thank you for the gifts you gave me. And I would really like a birthday present from Jay. And then that compelled Adnan to not call Jay with his new cell phone, not page Jay, who was a drug dealer, but to drive over to Jay's house and lend him his car and his phone. But then he said he already asked Heyman Lee for a ride and he called her the night before. So it's like, OK, this is it's like it's not lining up. So he's backed out of that and said he doesn't remember asking her for a ride. He said he was at track practice, but then people place him with Jay Wilds. He said he went shopping with Jay Wilds, but then Jay has all this information about where the body was buried. So then he's like, no. But my favorite alibi for him is during the time of the burial of the body. At one point during the trial phase, 80 people from his mosque were going to testify that he actually attended mosque. And I have this document. I've shown it in my videos. It's wild because it's 80 signatures signing something that's not true. Yeah. And, and everybody's they... name is Muhammad. Yeah. But then they found yeah, out that they were going to perjure themselves and they were like, nope, <laughs> I'm out on this one. Yeah. Yeah. And when they figure out that they can t prove his location, then they change it. So he right. has like those like those fake alibis. And then there's the new fake one that's not that new, which is the Asia McLean alibi. But all of them conflict with one another and they don't really they, they don't really jive any of them. Yeah. I mean, he never let's talk about the Asian McLean alibi. Um, oh, but first, didn't he also say that his that his car was in the shop and then he had no way to corroborate that? Um, yes. And so, so he abandoned he, that as well. So he said he asked for a ride because he lent his car to Jay. And then he's like, oh, his car wasn't working. That's why he asked for the ride. Then he's backed out completely of his anything to do with his car being wrong and said he was fixing his car at school because there's yeah. a gap in his school schedule that's unaccounted for, which mm -hmm. is the crucial gap. So yeah. he's gone through a million different versions of it. Right now he's on, I gave Jay the car after, because I wanted him to, you know, buy a present for Jay's girlfriend. And he wasn't that good of friends with Jay, just so you know. Right. According right, right. to him. They so were just kind of like drug dealing buddies, right? He, yeah. Well, he was a customer. Jay was the dealer, apparently. Okay. And so, yeah, he has, he has a bunch of conflicting alibis, a bunch of conflicting explanations. And his other one is that he doesn't remember. And yeah. one of my favorite parts of the serial podcast, he's like, oh, it might make me sound guilty that I can only remember stuff that helps me, but not remember anything that might hurt me. It's like, yeah. Yeah. And then I hear a lot of his supporters say like, well, do you remember what you ate for breakfast on July, whatever, 1990? It's like, well, that's not really what happened because they had broken up and then the police had called him that day, not even that late in the day uh, to, to get some information on Heyman Lee. So you would, you would expect for him to remember at least if he were innocent, everything after that, because the day would immediately have some level of import to him. Um, so that's just so oh, preposterous. Uh, and it, it's better to think of it like this. Do you remember your first ever real relationship? Yeah. 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 Do you think it would be memorable if the person that you were together with, couple weeks after you broke up completely disappeared and the police yeah. called you that day oh, to exactly. ask you what's right. going on and oh, yeah. if her entire korean community like started a search party for her do you think that would be something you would maybe commit to memory yeah of course of course um let's talk about asia mclean because this is another just bs piece of evidence so it's my understanding that um uh, syed never even claimed that he was at the library until asia mclean um came forward after the serial podcast is that true did she ever make these claims before the serial podcast so she actually did write letters at the time to adnan while he was in prison okay. and and the the interesting thing about this is that a lot of what the innocence fraud movement does is they try to pin stuff on people who can't defend themselves so adnan's original attorney uh, is dead like she passed away in 2004 so she she can't like there's no following up with her or anything like that. So they came up with the story that Adnan told his attorney to follow up on these letters. And she never did because for some reason she wanted Adnan to be convicted, maybe so she could fight it on appeal and make money off of this guy who didn't seem to come from a ton of money. So like she's dead. She can't defend herself or anything like that. But the real reason that Adnan didn't go with this story is because it conflicted with his other alibis. And one of the things that Asia McLean says in her story is that it was snowing the day of. Now, there was some snow on the ground, but the day of it was actually unseasonably warm. It was like 57 degrees. 
And there's a guy, Rob Chadwick, who I think he might be writing a book on how Adnan is guilty, who <laughs> has confronted her with this fact that it was like 57 degrees at this time of day when you're saying it was snowing. Like, how could it be snowing? So it's clearly yeah. a convert. If they were ever in the library together, it would be a different day. And on top of that, two sisters, not of uh, not of um, uh, Asia McLean, but two sisters actually have issued sworn statements in a court of law saying that she was going to cover for Adnan. Like she was willing to lie for him that she told she thought he was innocent. She, right. Yes. Hmm, and yeah. she had a chance to testify in a 2012 appeal because she resubmitted her statements in 2010. <laughs> But the prosecutor, and, but she said the prosecutor had made this airtight case and then she just abandoned, abandoned shit. Yeah. But if you really believed that you had this exonerating information about somebody, would you give a crap what the prosecutor was, was telling you? You'd be like, no, like, like we were together. There's no way he did this. She was afraid of purging herself. That That's why. It, it's also like what they had to tie her there, tie yeah. him with cell phone records and like, uh -huh. If you, if you told me somebody close to me or somebody I knew murdered somebody and I was with them at that specific time and then they said, oh, well, some location data, I would be like, no, no, the location data is wrong. Yeah, like, it, that doesn't make sense. Exactly. Exactly. So I guess let's talk about the cell phone record. So um, what they talk about in Serial and in this HBO documentary is this cover letter that they get with the cell phone data from AT&T from no known source corroborated by no experts that says that incoming calls, or is it outgoing? No, incoming calls are going to be less accurate with the location data than outgoing calls. What they fail to mention is there was also a totally incriminating outgoing call at the time of the burial, at the burial site. Uh, no, they don't talk about that at all in the HBO documentary um, or in Serial, I think. Uh, and then they're just expecting us to believe because of this cover letter um, from AT&T that it's some kind of coincidence that these incoming calls place them at the murder scene at the time of the burial. So if you want to talk a little bit about that. Right. So, so the, so essentially there's, there's two calls that are in dispute and these are the key calls, but it's important to note that when you look at the way that the defense talks about the cell phone data is they don't dispute the location data of any of the incoming or outgoing calls between this window of time, which is 7 PM to 9 PM. Right. Because all of that essentially lines up with their theory of defense. So all of a sudden, randomly between nine and seven, that's when things get all wonky and don't make any sense. So the paper right. says something about incoming calls not being as reliable for location data or something like that. Um, Serial actually reached out to cell phone experts for their podcast because they didn't have a source for this except for it's just a piece of paper that was attached. And they said... All of their experts said there's no scientific difference between incoming and outgoing calls. But right. if we're to believe that, that there is a difference, then that means that coincidentally, two times at Lincoln Park, which is where they buried the body, there were two accidental inadvertent pings to Lincoln Park cell phone tower. And that tower only covers the park more or less. There's like a right. couple of side streets. Yeah. So it's like pretty solid. But even more crucially, after that, at eight o'clock, they dump the car somewhere else, and that's covered by a different tower. And guess what? Outgoing calls ping that, and it's within an hour of each other. Some of the calls are at 709, then 714. Those are the incoming at the burial site. They dug a very shallow grave. And then an hour later, or I'm sorry, at 804 and 805, there's outgoing calls from the car dump site. So that means he was near where the car was dumped after the body was buried. But coincidentally, he had nothing to do with anything related to the burial <laughs> or the disposal of the car. And when people called Jay because they knew that they were together and got Jay's phone and all, uh, and they called Adnan's phone to talk to Jay and Adnan picked up, that's also a coincidence for that window of time. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I guess we should talk about, about Jay because I feel like uh, the defense has hinged so much on what Jay has said, Jay's analysis, Jay's priors, which are inadmissible because he wasn't convicted for almost anything. Um, but nobody's talking about why he changed his story, his total lack of motive, um, and then his drug history, which I think is really important. So uh, why don't you talk a little bit about what Jay said and how Jay's story changed? So- so there's a lot of focus on Jay's story changing and, you know, different points where he was uncooperative, which is true because, you know, Baltimore's where the stop snitching movement comes from and all that. 
But all of Jay's changes in his story, and by the way, this is all present in an interview that he did with The Intercept, are related to his drug dealing and not trying to get convicted for drug dealing. Right. And they're also related to him not trying to rope his grandmother into his his version of events because he was dealing drugs outside of his out of his grandmother's house where he was living at the time, which is why he lied about seeing the body outside of her house. Right. Yes. Okay. Like so he's he 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 said he saw it outside of a Best Buy and he told his friend that he saw the body um, somewhere else. I, f- I forget where in front of a different friend's house. So but when you when you like think about Jay's testimony and what he changed and all that after he was con- convinced by the police that they weren't going to go after him for drug dealing he became cooperative he mm-hmm. still maintained the lie and he did lie on the stand about that so it's not just a lie to the police it's also perjury about where he sold the body so that is very sketchy but this is in the context of jay being a stupid person and in the context of jay uh not being worried about the 90s drug laws, which were very strict. I mean, this is when New York had the famous Rockefeller drug laws. Baltimore had something similar. Mm -hmm. But more importantly than what Jay lied about is what Jay told the truth about. Because Jay, or what Jay told other people about this at the time. At the time, yeah. Yes, because Heyman Lee goes missing January 13th. They don't find her until six weeks later into February. Jay told one of his friends, Jen Pusateri, or... I. Maybe I'm mispronouncing that name, but you could look her up. And she's featured in the documentary. That's her name. Yeah. Yeah. Um, he told her that Adon had killed Hay that day. She's been missing for hours at this point, like two hours. So he knew that she was dead already. And he had told her. And then he told another person. He also had her pull up somewhere so he could get shovels out of his car because he said Adon needed shovels to bury the body. And And this is before any information had been released about even her being missing and definitely not the discovery of her body, which didn't happen for six weeks. Right. So, like, yeah. So she's she's missing and people know she's missing because she didn't go to pick up her cousin. But when I say people know she's missing, I mean, it hasn't made the local news yet. Like the parents are contacting the police at this point and they're contacting the close friends. Jay wasn't a close friend at all and he had been out all day. So there was no way for him to know she was missing, much less dead. But it turns out she was dead and she was buried in a park. And he said, and all of these things Jay told to another person. And she was able to testify to that in trial. So okay. regardless, at this point, you have to have the killer be somewhat connected to Jay. And Jay has no motive. And it would be amazingly coincidental that Jay was able to borrow Adnan's car and his cell phone in order to frame him. Also, he can give bad statements to the police and then they tell him not to worry about his drug dealing. And then he gets convicted as an accomplice to add on. And he's thinking of all of this on January 13th, the day she went missing hours later, like laying right, the groundwork right, right. for it. And so something either- that HBO and Serial failed to um, hammer down is, is why on earth would he would he do this? What motive would Jay have to kill Hay? Well, if you notice the the documentary and the podcast never really solidly point the finger at anybody. They just say, this person's shady. Here's all the reasons that they They suck. do it, Don. They almost straight oh. up pointed at Don. We'll talk about that in a minute, but... Yeah, but but the reason they don't do that is because in reality, no suspect works besides add Don. Mm-hmm. So if you start to think about any single person involved in this case, it doesn't work. That's why there's like all this nonsense in the HBO series about how Hayes' family didn't care about her, and how like oh they were they were like they Adnan tells a story apparently that Hay told him of abuse and Adnan's like I'm the only one who cared about her abuse story in the whole world like I'm such a great guy like it's all these things but like all of it's nonsense it's just window dressing because fundamentally the only person with the motive to kill her was Adnan right. the only person with the opportunity to kill her was Adnan every other suspect doesn't make any sense and it actually gets even funnier because when they revealed the supposed alternative suspects they considered they're close friends of adnan that only work as accomplices with him right 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 um and this thing with don is so ridiculous i feel terrible for him i mean um i just can't believe how he was smeared especially in the hbo documentary but i noticed last night when i was watching it they're talking about don and they're clearly framing him as a suspect and then they do this like little montage of houses next to don like in don's neighborhood and they zoom in on one that has a confederate flag 
and it's um it's it's just a random house i it's not his house it's <laughs> it's not his parents house it's just a house somewhere near where he may have lived at that time and i'm thinking like this is so incredibly biased and then outside of i mean that's not evidence but they never really introduced any evidence about about Don. He pretty much had an ironclad alibi. He was clocked into work, um, which they tried to destroy. It was totally ineffective. And then they brought in someone from Lens Crafters who, like, 10 years later said that he might have had some scratches on his hand um, uh, the, at the time of the murder. But uh, what what do you, you think about uh, Don's age? I don't know if you caught this part. He's He was much older. Or like, he was 21 or something like that. So in the documentary, Don is 22 years old. Mm -hmm. Right. And he's such a pervert because Heyman Lee is 18. And obviously that's like a baby. But <laughs> in reality, Don is 20 years old. And she's like, 18. Yeah. They aged him up for the documentary. Oh, that's like, such bullshit. Like it's something that you have to catch there. But yeah, he's he's not. He's that's not right. Older. And then they had that whole scene with one of her friends where she was like, yeah, he tried to bang me and I, I rebuffed it because well, I was like, why would you even put this in here? He's like, he's just a dude that's dating chicks within his within a certain friend group. Like, who cares? This is totally normal teenage behavior. He apparently met Hay at work. So it's like people who work together that are adults that date and he was only dating her for 13 days like this yeah. wasn't you know like a huge thing and hey obviously had a crush on him because you know they're reading her diary right in, in these documentaries and she's writing before they start dating that she has a crush on him yeah how mortifying too that to have your diary read to everybody to support the exoneration of somebody that murdered you. Um, I mean, sh I'm sure that this would just upset her so much. How, it must upset the family so much too. How creepy is it that they got an actress that sounded almost exactly so like So creepy. The whole thing was so creepy. I was like, I was watching. I was like, I cannot believe. Can you imagine her? I'm sure her family saw that. Uh, how, how horrifying that would be. Um, her, her family is a very interesting component of this because one of their huge disadvantages, because they like to play up the, the, the racism element of it. And we make unless fun you're of, Korean. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, we make fun of this um, because it's like Kim Kardashian and all these Innocence Project people disproportionately are trying to free black people that kill white people. Mm -hmm. So they will use as evidence that they killed a white person. Yeah. Therefore, that means there's racism against the black guy, which is right. Right, right. so off the wall and wild and one of the funnier ones was julius jones where they're like they're like oh they're so racist against this guy meanwhile they're actually trying to frame the other black guy <laughs> i know i know and then here they're they're just blatantly openly disparaging the korean community um and but, then the parents are at such a disadvantage because they're are they still not english speaking yeah they don't the, the the parents don't speak english her only direct relative that spoke english was her little brother and again, he's her little brother. So he's like the only one who can be a good advocate for her. And so, they're trying to frame him as the anonymous caller, right? Oh, yeah. That that was particularly nasty. That's the director of the filmmaker. So they know who the anonymous caller is. It's obviously one of Adnan's associates. Because, uh, you know, they try to figure out who that is. But there's like protections for anonymous callers under law. So they know who it is. And the information that he gave was where Adnan would bang hay. Something that you don't really tell your little brother in a yeah. relationship that you're not supposed to have. And other and she also identified some of Adnan's uh, the caller identified some of Adnan's other friends mm -hmm. that this kid wouldn't know about because Hay was hiding the relationship from her family. But so why would you he, tell your little brother, you know? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, the, 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 the filmmaker. So the the brother is really angry about the process because he was essentially emailed on like a Saturday to show up to the hearing. And then he doesn't live in the area anymore because, you know, why would your family stay in an area where your sister got murdered? Um, so he had no time to get off work and then travel to the courthouse. And Maryland law means uh, protects your right to appear in the same manner as the defendant under a victim rights statute. So they specifically did this so he wouldn't show up. Then he got upset about it, hired an attorney, and then the filmmaker started attacking the brother. And the reason it's specifically nasty is because the whole narrative of the film is that Adnan was framed. So now you're saying her brother, who was like 15 or 16 at the time, was in on the framing because, you know, the brother doesn't want the real killer of the sister caught. Like, it makes no sense. Yeah, it's it's preposterous. I think that we should go back a little bit and talk about the nature of their relationship, because this is something that was um, really played up uh, by his supporters, that he was this 
great guy that loved her so much. But in reality, she was afraid of him. She had to be protected um, from by, by, a, by a teacher, I think, uh, right. from him at school. Um, and he had written her threatening notes. So the, the relationship had clearly devolved into one uh, that was that was abusive. And she there was evidence that she was afraid for her life. Yeah. So, it, you know, they they read the sections of, you know, the the puppy love phase in the in the documentary where she's right. And, you know, it's very dramatic. It's very teenage girl. Mm -hmm. Right. Like one of the things you get from her diary is this was like a very like normal, obviously in a nerdy magnet school, but a pretty much normal, popular in a nerdy group kind of teenage girl. Yeah. So they'll read all this stuff about how Adnan's this great guy when they first start dating and all that. But and they had broken up a bunch of times. But when she started seeing Don, which was very close to the time that she was murdered, or actually it wasn't even that. Apparently she got him a Christmas gift that was like a really nice jacket. Like this is what a lot of her friends say. And um, he thought that that was like, oh, we're getting back together. And she was like, no, it's just that we're really close and we're friends. So that's like supposedly right when the relationship went really south. So that eventually leads to her writing a letter and you can read in the letter like I've read it on air. I've I played her reading it from the actress where she's she's just tells him she's like, leave me alone. We're not getting back together. It's not the end of the world. Like, like you're going to get over it move yeah. on. Like, please stop. Like, I don't want to be so cold and like end it like this, but it's not going to happen. And this letter apparently is a follow up of her Adnan seeing her and Don out on a date or something like that. So. At that point in the relationship, they were having some serious problems. They weren't friends anymore. And he was calling her still every day, multiple times a day. So, like, you know, the idea that there was no um, jilted lover syndrome, like I've seen a, a bunch of Adnan advocates say that that didn't exist. No, they'll find you could find friends that say that existed. You can find friends of hers that oh, yeah. say that he was a problem for her and all that they just choose in the documentary which is even more pro adnan than the podcast to not highlight any of that yeah yeah that's definitely true um okay let's talk before we talk about the dna let's talk a little bit about rabia um of course it's not addressed in the hbo documentary particularly but she has really insidious motives uh for protecting them i mean first she is a family friend um, and then we've seen this like Muslim tribal protection thing <laughs> with the 80 people that signed on to corroborate his totally fake alibi um, that dropped out of that when they realized they were going to perjure themselves. So so there's a community thing here with Rabia um, and then a familial thing. Additionally, it appears that she has made a shitload of money off of this case. And not only that, but she is launching a career off the back of defending Syed. Um, if you want to talk a little bit about her motivation and why she cannot be trusted, uh, that'd be great. So, you know, Rabia, like you are right. He's a, he, she's a family friend of Adnan Syed, but it's, it's actually more than that. Adnan's best friend. That's his best friend's older sister. Like okay. She's actually there in the initial local news report saying, I'm so surprised that this could happen and all that. Um, like way back in 1999, like she's there at that point in time. But um, so when people think Adnan Saeed is, in, is innocent, they'll say, oh, well, I heard it in a podcast. I, I, I saw it in the HBO documentary or the other podcast that's actually done by Rabia. But what they don't seem to realize is that the podcast serial, the story was given to uh, Sarah Koenig by, by Rabia. Rabia. Yeah, like it's her version of events. It's like, hey, I have this guy. I think he's innocent. Could you just run my talking points on your podcast? Mm -hmm. And even though most of these talking points were just lost on appeal, some of them are just not admissible because they're objectively not evidence. They get run in the serial podcast. And Rabia actually hates that podcast because she actually did a little bit of research and pointed out that, yeah, Adnan was jealous and like all these problems. So yeah. she actually thinks that that podcast was too unfair to Adnan, which is crazy because that launched the whole movement to free him in the national consciousness. But then there's the documentary. The documentary is not only a story from Rabia. It's actually an adaptation of her book on how Adnan Saeed is innocent. So that also comes from her. And it, you find that every single piece of innocence propaganda from 
r- related to this case comes from this one woman who, again, is like very intimately connected with Adnan's best friend. And mm-hmm. she's made millions off of this case. Her book is a bestseller. If she came out tomorrow and said Adnan's actually guilty, sorry, guys, she would lose all of her credibility. And she's using this to launch into more true crime nonsense. And one of the things I found hilarious is that her new podcast, she's going to be working with a Broadway actor, which, you know, makes a lot of sense because this is all just a production. It's all a (laughs) stage. It's not legit in any way. And every little piece of evidence, you can actually trace it to something where she takes a piece of a file, cuts out an excerpt of it, and then throws that out into the public on its own. And then the state of Maryland that actually, you know, has other things to do, it takes them like weeks or months to like find that piece of the file and then refute it in the public. Mm -hmm. So there's a bunch of things that people will leave in my comments that have been like refuted a month after they were put out, but they just never heard about it because everybody's giving a voice to Rabia. Yeah. Yeah. That's definitely true. I mean, she, she clearly can't be trusted. She has um, motivations that people aren't addressing. Uh, I did want to, she does the Linda Sarsour thing. If you see her in her original interview, no hijab, all of a sudden, she not only has the hijab, but every in the podcast, they describe her as like, oh, a woman rounded with a like her face is rounded with the hijab and all that. Yeah. So she's doing that as like a political thing, because remember, this is about Islamophobia for some reason. Oh, I know. <laughs> I, and now I'm wondering if we should check out the veracity of her claims that she was in a, an abusive traditional Pakistani marriage. Uh, I can't that, refute that because I haven't even looked into it, but I was watching it and I was like, well, this is convenient. <laughs> That, that that made me – so obviously abuse is not good, but it kind of <laughs> is a bit amusing when somebody says that and then throughout the course of the documentary, they're always cooking as yeah. like their mission. <laughs> She's like giving people tea immediately. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. But, but yeah, like the, the documentary, you know, on the one hand, the state has evidence and a clearly easily prosecutable case. On the other hand, Rabia's husband didn't treat her well and uh, – Adnan's mom was diagnosed with leukemia because like that's yeah. that's what the documentary legitimately is and that scene yeah. where she tells her and she's like oh my god I'm like Rabia go take them acting classes <laughs> yeah she sucks uh yeah but it has it, it was emotionally um manipulative for sure I, and a lot of things I was watching I was like this has no relevance like like she was like oh have you told have you told Adnan about it about about you having leukemia I'm like what no talk about the murder talk about the evidence I don't care about any of this um, speaking of that, I did want to talk about this lividity thing because of all of the evidence outside of the cell phone records, I think this might be the one that's the most grossly misrepresented by advocates of Syed. So um, for those of you who don't know, uh, lividity is um, the pooling of blood. Uh, and so what they're saying based on based on the autopsy records, which is not what the autopsy said, but the defense is saying that because she had blood pooled on her front and it takes eight to 12 hours for lividity to set in, that she must have been murdered and then uh, laid there for a while and then buried later, which messes up the timeline for the prosecution. Um, but actually, full front lividity is just a term that's been made up by by Rabia. Like, I, I don't see any yeah. evidence that this even exists anywhere else. Um, and that's not at all what the autopsy report says. The autopsy report says that it was fixed on anterior surfaces except for the areas exposed to pressure. And so anterior, that doesn't mean the front. It means it means closer to the front. And she was buried on her side so um so it actually is consistent that she was she was buried on her side her, her face and her chest um had lividity and that's where she was buried and there was pooling of blood which it says in the autopsy report. So can you talk a little bit about this and how it was misrepresented by the defense? Yeah, so I mean you you basically nailed it. It's it's all in the autopsy report and Rabia just took an excerpt from the report and then, you know, like she really hacked it up because she had to take like a <laughs> sentence from this report. I know, yeah. In, in order to make this a thing. And then she had she basically claimed that anterior means full frontal lividity, which is ridiculous. Like it's mm-hmm. it's not true. And she plays on the idea. So the first thing I do whenever I find claims from these documents is I'll search the phrase. So you search lividity, and the first thing you find is that there's one mention of lividity in the entire document. Right. However, in like the next paragraph, which technically goes to the next page. So you have to do a little bit of work. You have to read one and a half pages to figure out Robbie as lying, which is a lot of work for the free ad non people. 
uh, they talk about liver mortis, which is lividity. Lividity mm -hmm. is just a shorthand for it. And there they explain in detail where it was. And you're right. It's like she had um she was buried like on her side, but there was there were certain parts that were facing the ground. And like, you know, lividity, it's just lividity is just where the grav uh, gravity pulls your blood. Like because your blood right. stops pumping and then gravity determines where it's going to pool. And so, it says that on the autopsy report, it says that areas exposed to pressure showed yeah. um, showed lividity, which would have been her face and chest. Yeah, and it, and it, it makes it's it's the areas around it. Like it makes it makes sense if you like if you take like a pen and you press it into your arm, then you're going to see an indent around it. So you just imagine like the dirt or whatever. Like if there's like something that's pressing on her cheek then the lividity is going to be around it. And it's stronger around that area because that's the area that was in contact. That was, mm -hmm. that was the thing. And it's very detailed in the description of where it is. Like they, they, they lay it out pretty clearly. And it's, it's considering we're talking about the same report. Robbie is pulling up that report and this is the actual report. You could tell she's manipulating this information, but yeah. if you make an ad non video and you don't specifically mention the lividity, you're going to get comments up the ass about it. Like, that's <laughs> why I have that specific video. Uh, it's yeah. one of the only ones on my channel where I have it segmented out. So it's yeah. like, if you make your stupid claim, go click the thing. I'm going to address it because yeah. Yeah, it, yeah. it's it's just nonsensical. And it, this is all to mess up the timeline in order to make Adnan innocent. Because since they don't really have any suspects that work for it, they're, they're trying to, I guess, make the case that Heyman Lee might have voluntarily went somewhere else. And maybe mm. she was killed on a different day or something like that. But like, that doesn't make any sense. She always picked up her cousin, which is what she was supposed to do at three, which is what alerted people to the fact that she was missing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's certainly true. Um, I guess we should get into the DNA evidence uh, because I hear this all the time. It's like, it's so shocking. And I used to believe this too. It's so shocking they didn't test the DNA evidence. Um, because of this, this CSI effect, we're all so obsessed with DNA evidence, but especially trace DNA, it's misled and created ambiguity in so many cases. Um, and in a case like this, where there is tons of other evidence, what is DNA evidence that isn't under her fingernails going to tell us about about who the killer is? I don't, I don't give a crap about what DNA evidence is found in her car if it's not around a device that killed her or anything like that. So can you talk a little bit about the DNA that they tested and why uh, Syed supporters think that this is uh, such an important issue? Right. And and you're, you're right. It is the CSI effect. We expect the DNA to come back and prove that these people are guilty or innocent, even though 92 percent of cases are not DNA cases. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about 1999. So yeah. there was no touch DNA science back in 1999. Like they, they like now today, if there's a murder, they don't even fingerprint anything. They look for touch DNA because it's more accurate and all of that. And and you have to kind of choose between what you're going to do. That's how sophisticated it is now. So what they wanted to do was retest some of these old objects. And in the first video I made on this, I talked about how it, it's not going to show anything because DNA doesn't come with the timestamp. So if you retest mm -hmm. objects from the car and you find Adnan's DNA in there, they're going to be like, well, that's Adnan's uh, ex-girlfriend's car. Obviously, he was in it. Nobody disputes that. It makes but sense. But the same is DNA. true of anybody that has been in the car. Yeah, but but they don't grant that. If they find yeah. other people's DNA, then all of a sudden it's it's a case of, oh, well, that's definitely the killer because it's it's a, it's anybody but Adnan. Uh, I, I know a guy, Rob Chadwick, that calls them Q Ad Adnan like, <laughs> because it's just whatever conspiracy works. Yeah. So they actually tested the nails. They they tested a bunch of different things that would have been more useful, but the DNA had degraded by that point so that it wasn't it wasn't particularly useful. The key thing that you would want to test in a strangulation case would be Heyman Lee's neck. But mm -hmm. obviously, she died in 1999. They didn't preserve the skin on her neck for DNA testing they didn't know to exist or anything like that. So the next best thing would be maybe you test her clothes which is what they did and her clothes yielded no results which is not surprising she was missing her body was there for six weeks touch dna in the exposed elements tends to degrade in like 28 days or something like that but then they also had a pair of shoes that were in her car and they tested those and they found four dna profiles and they declared that adnan saeed since he wasn't one of those profiles was innocent and now you have people why saying, would the killer touch her shoes exactly well it's also it, it's it's quite literally i p had people contact me that do that are in school stu like studying to be forensic techs 
it's quite literally one of their exercises to swab their shoes for DNA to just show you how much touch DNA you step on or biological material right. you step on each and every day. So mm -hmm. like the idea that Heyman Lee's shoes, which we don't even have any proof that she was wearing at the time, there's two pairs of shoes in the car and uh, one of they tested one of them yielded some DNA like she could have easily stepped on this. Remember, she went to school. Like, I don't know if you've been in a school. It's nasty. There's DNA everywhere in everywhere. places you can't yeah. imagine. And the <laughs> idea that Adnan not touching her shoes during the course of this murder means he didn't kill her doesn't make any sense. Yeah. Like, like I, I joke about it. I'm like, they might as well have tested the shoes that were in her home. Because like, well, think yeah, about why would many, it make a difference? Yeah, yeah, you find you find way more real killers there, or like you know O.J. Simpson. Like we we all think O.J. did it, but we've never tested the shoes that were in Nicole Brown Simpson's car. So mm -hmm. how can we even believe that? Yeah, and that is the reason that they didn't test it in 1999 because it, uh, DNA technology was not as advanced as as it is now, and they were like, this is not going to help prove who killed her. Uh, and so I, I understand why. Um, and then they've gone after, what is this Indian guy's name? Uh, is he the state attorney? Oh yeah. The, 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 the guy who was handling the appeals, he was technically a candidate for, oh, right, right. Uh, for the, the state attorney, which is what they call the district attorney in Baltimore. So, but he was in private practice, but they were letting him handle the appeals because he said he would do it pro bono. Yeah. And they they paint him as like this total ass and all that. Meanwhile, he's he seems like a pretty decent guy. Yeah. He went to the magnet school, so it like kind of cuts close to home. Right. That somebody from a school that he graduated from, like he wasn't friends with Hay or anything like that, but like a school that he graduated from. Oops. My um, phone started, good my thing phone that he's thing. he's not a white guy. I mean, they would have just totally oh, crucified yeah. him. Uh, but they did their best. So I was like, this this nice Indian guy, like he was so polite in all the HBO interviews when they were just hammering him while he was walking. He was like, thank you. Thank you. I hope you have a nice day. Yeah. <laughs> this poor guy. Um, but yeah, I don't think he did anything wrong. Can you talk a little bit about political motivations um, and how that has affected uh, the decision to vacate? So it so okay. So first, you, first thing you need to know is that Adnan lost every single appeal. Every single issue being raised in the vacation um, motion was defeated by the state's attorney on appeal because that's who handles the up uh, the appeals. So none of none of the vacation is proof of the fact that he would be innocent. It's just a motion to get rid of the conviction where you can have a new trial. Right. So what happened in this case is that Maryland passed a law, which is like a conviction integrity law that essentially allows the district attorney or the state's attorney, but they're the same thing. Just don't, don't worry about it. The prosecutor to come to the court and say, hey, I have questions about a conviction for my own office and I would like the judge to look at it. That is what Mosby did. So she filed essentially a motion on behalf of Adnan as the prosecutor, and the defense filed the motion on behalf of Adnan as his actual defense. And what ultimately ended up happening when you're a judge and you get two motions saying this guy didn't do it is you vacate the conviction. So mm -hmm. Mosby, who was the who was the state's attorney, did that. And the reason she did that is because she lost her primary. And she was out the door and she's facing federal fraud charges. And this would bring up a lot of good press for her. Yeah. Because even though she's one of these district attorneys who doesn't fight anything, doesn't prosecute anything, she was kind of staying strong on the Adnan case and not pushing for this up until this point. But then, of course, she loses her election. She needs good press. So that's why she does mm -hmm. it. Now, on top of that, the guy who won the primary, do you remember the documentary where they had the, the primary election as three candidates? Mm -hmm. There's the Indian guy who's like prosecuting the Adnan case, Mosby, who's kind of in the yeah. middle. And then they have that other guy, the black guy, that's like, oh, I'm going to free Adnan. Yeah. They had the what same was his name, primary. Ivy? Yeah, something like that. But they had the same private primary election. That guy won. Mm -hmm. So even if Mosby didn't do this, this guy was going to do this because right. this is part of what he ran, ran on. So yeah. the fix was in. So yeah. they file the motion. Adnan gets he gets his conviction vacated. There's no opposition to it. The family, they even cheated the family by not letting them show up to testify. So there's quite literally no opposition to it in the courtroom. And then Mosby sets up this standard where and you can see her in the interview where she says, OK, we're going to test the DNA. If the DNA comes back, not Adnan, then we're going to say he's innocent. If the DNA comes back inconclusive, right, you would think that would mean it's inconclusive. She said, we're going to say Adnan is innocent. 
So the fix was in. And then she's like, oh, if the DNA comes back Adnan, then we'll consider our options. Which so it's, it <laughs> doesn't even make okay. him guilty if it comes back him. Yeah. 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 So like th that's how this was all set up. That's how this was concocted. And and that's what led to him being freed. So it's a total it's a total like misnomer that he proved anything, submitted any evidence that was compelling because all the appeals say the contrary. And as yeah. far as the Brady violations. These were all adjudicated in a court of law. And mm -hmm. what they're saying is that the Brady violation is that the police investigated some alternative suspects and may or may not have disclosed that to the defense. But that's not I exonerating. So I, why, do, why does it matter? Right. I mean, and I don't even know if that is something that you're supposed to disclose to the defense. But I do know that the defense attorney's dead. So we have no idea if they did right. disclose it because she's dead. Yeah. So like there's no there's no. um. There's no uh, there's there's nothing there. There's no teeth to that. So they they just allege that there's Brady violations. They just don't ex they don't exist. And they've been defeated on appeal whenever they were raised. And the alternative suspect would have been Adnan's friend and mentor at the mosque. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Doesn't work as an alternative suspect. He only works as an accomplice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I think I hit all the major points. Have you been hearing anything else from his supporters in your comment section um, that you wanted to steal man right now. Um, I, I mean, people give the overall, like, this is a very thin case and like, you know, just in case we have to be cautious, there's a reasonable doubt and all that. And that that's just nonsensical. Like just because on forensic files or, or on CSI or whatever, like you see DNA or like, you know, the, the flower, like, you know, they'll do like the plant plant equivalent of DNA or a lot of trace evidence or whatever in order to tie a case together doesn't mean that the majority of cases are like that. This case right. has more than other murder convictions, a lot more. You have the cell phone data, you have the eyewitness testimony, like you have red fibers and Jay had the detail in his testimony that Adnan was wearing red gloves. Like that's something that doesn't get emphasized enough. And in fact, in the documentary, they try to turn it around and say Adnan didn't have clothing with red fibers. It's like, yeah, Jay said those were the gloves. That's what they found at the scene. And Jay didn't know how like, would he have known would... that right yeah exactly so so there's a lot that is there for this case and i understand why these people if you hear one side of the story you think that one side of the story is correct but it's just not true right and i understand why people uh you know everybody gets outraged when innocent people are convicted for things that they that they didn't do and i and i understand that outrage and i fell victim to this too but um, in that outrage, we forget that there is a girl murdered and there's a family that has to deal with this and not only have to deal with the loss of their child, their sister, but have to deal with everybody thinking that the, the person that clearly murdered them is innocent. It's just adding insult to injury. Um, and the Innocence Project, I, you know, I think they've, they've done some good work. That they got the Duke lacrosse guys off. Um, they've, they've clearly done some good things. But their focus they lately... They didn't, the, they didn't get the Duke lacrosse team off. They didn't? No, the, oh. the, the the charges were dropped because they had no evidence. Oh, OK. What, so what, what good in, have they done? Have they done any that, cases where they they, they uh, legitimately... sure, there's 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 plenty of like rape and murders where the obvious obviously the rapist is the one who did the murder where uh -huh. they do DNA testing and then they find out that like the DNA doesn't match the guy that they thought did it. Like right. I'm 100 percent sure that like, some of those exist for sure. But those right. are the easy ones. And like, I'm fine with an organization that does redoes DNA testing and all that. Mm -hmm. But um, like, the, no. The Why Duke did La I La think this about the Duke lacrosse guys? So the Duke lacrosse one is interesting because um, the prosecutor withheld. He knew that they were innocent after right. the, they did the DNA because they tested every white player on the team because the woman accused only white players of participating in the assault. And he knew that it, they, it didn't match any of them. But he held it till after his election, and he ultimately ended up getting disbarred over that because ah. he needed the attention. But yeah, that that they they were never convicted on that one, just in okay. the court of public opinion. Um, but um, but lately, the Innocence Project has just been picking up these um these like podcasted, uh, racially motivated crimes and and people that supposedly have been um convicted in the court of public opinion because of their race, and that's like the only cases that they're taking these days. Uh, and so now I've just I just the innocence, I just, I just hate them. They, they could be doing actual wrong, wrongful conviction cases, but it seems like they're not. Well, they're, they're, you have to remember the innocence project is founded by one of OJ Simpson's uh, attorneys. So <laughs> this guy is, is the guy behind the innocence project. Really? I didn't know that. Yes. It, 
So that that's the that's the guy behind it. That's the Kim Kardashian connection because Rob Kardashian was friends with OJ Simpson and all that. But the thing is, is like it's not that the Innocence Project is taking up these cases that are that they're doing podcasts on. The Innocence Project produces these cases like they produce the documentaries right. and the podcasts and all that. Like if you remember Stephen Avery making a murderer, that's uh-huh. an Innocence Project production. Rabia works for the Baltimore Innocence Project. Like, yeah. So they're they're actually behind the propaganda campaign. And there's one thing I do want to point out because we touched on the Islamophobia element of this. If you remember in the documentary, there's one specific scene where they show the Islamophobia in the court. And it's incredibly deceptive because it's actually during the bail hearing where they say that there are other cases of Pakistani men who kill lovers that leave them here in the United States. And then their community helps them go to Pakistan. So that is like brush past so you get her to say something about pakistani men and all that but that's the bail hearing that had no impact on his trial or anything like that really that was just whether or not for him to go there they hadn't even selected the jury at that time so man. like that, that's like a I little that. trick that they throw in there mm. man that's disappointing about because making a murderer I've, I've always thought that stephen avery was guilty as well or uh at least brandon a Brandon Avery, I don't think was involved, but I think Stephen Avery was. But Kathleen Zellner, who uh, took that case, she got Ryan Ferguson out of jail, and he truly was wrongfully convicted, I believe. Uh, so I think that maybe they're kind of muddying the waters by picking up these cases where it's where it's clear wrongful conviction, and then they're using that to um, gain public trust to well, to produce Avery, these things. Avery, the first time would have been would have been a guy because the 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 rape like that he was originally convicted of, uh-huh. you know, that they say this is the reason why the police framed him for the murder. Right. Like, his DNA didn't match. And there's yeah. a good case that they coached this woman into drawing a sketch of the wrong person. So, uh-huh. you know, he is innocent of that. And there's actually a guy who wrote a book on why Avery was innocent of that. It helped him get out of prison who wrote a they asked him to write a book about avery's murder and this guy's like he's a hundred percent guilty and the key piece of evidence <laughs> that that's never explained in any of the in any of that like 20 episode series is that they found avery's sweat dna mm-hmm. under the latch of this woman's hood right. he called her twice to get her to come to the property using star six seven and then he called her afterwards and left her like a message like you didn't show up to create an alibi and then he makes the case to law enforcement that he never saw her that day so there's a bunch of things in there that show he's guilty plus all of her bones like all 206 of the bones in that human woman's body were on avery's property right so the idea that anybody could have framed this smashed up all her bones and then brought them back perfectly without losing a single fragment absurd i know why would kathleen zellner do that she did such good work on the ryan ferguson case so disappointing um but in terms of the case that we're talking about i mean i think that you're totally right and i don't think that enough people are really looking at the facts of the case this has been uh totally taken over by the woke mob and now um this has been a miscarriage of justice and a total tragedy for the Lee family. And I think that that's really what's being forgotten here. So if you wanted to add anything else, um, now would be the time. I, I was going to say this. It has a lot of consequences because Adnan is now doing speeches. Rabia, she just posted an image saying that he has to start a podcast because it's not enough to free these people. You have to make them into celebrities and multi-millionaires. I, I would hope yeah. that Marilyn would fight back against his eventual lawsuit. And, you know, not pay him a dime because he doesn't deserve a dime. He was not wrongfully convicted. But this creates an attitude that gets into people's minds that makes them support really bad criminal justice policy. Yes. That leads to other people getting out. There was just a story out yesterday in Philadelphia. Conviction Integrity Unit. Very similar statute to what we we're dealing with now. They released a man a year ago who was accused of shooting a man in his 40s to death. He just shot another man in his 50s now to death. So, oh like, we're letting killers out, and just because Adnan's going to become a millionaire and probably not kill again, maybe, maybe a woman steps out of line and he yokes her out, but, you know, because that's what he <laughs> likes to do. But just because Adnan is, is maybe not going to kill anybody again because he's too high profile doesn't mean that other killers aren't being released. Remember, 30 people were released the same day Adnan was released. Mm-hmm. 30 convictions just thrown out by the same district attorney who's trying to bolster her own reputation. So it's a huge problem. Yep. Yeah, definitely. Um, I've discussed a bunch of cases on my podcast recently. Eliza Fletcher was one. Um, 
where the perpetrator, uh, I think he was even let out of jail because of COVID or something. He was serving like a 40 year charge or something like that. So people are forgetting that there are major ramifications and a, an extremely high level of recidivism um, amongst people that are in jail for violent crimes. And, uh, and that really does get lost when we all become so invested in the entertainment value of you, these you cases. Should definitely, you should definitely talk to Roberta, Roberta Glass, somebody that me and Devin have talked to before. And she does a true crime podcast, but it's like largely about how a bunch of these people are guilty. And she's like obsessive detail oriented. If I'm not familiar <laughs> with the case, I'll, I'll seek her out. And What's her name? Roberta Glass? Roberta Glass. Yeah. Okay. She does the Roberta Glass true crime report. I was on her thing a couple of a couple of days ago, actually. I definitely get her on because she like you could throw any case at her and she'll have like the details because she has episodes for years on this topic. Oh, the true crime community has gone so, so woke. It's so frustrating. Even sword and scale. Um, You know, I like Mike Bidet, but like the other day or a few weeks ago, I heard him say again on his podcast, like, oh, Rodney Reed clearly didn't do it. I was like, what are you what are you talking about? <laughs> like, and I'm pretty sure he's an advocate for the release of Julius Jones. And but he gets it right sometimes but but this has clearly influenced the true crime community and that's influencing people to put political pressure um on on their state representatives and things like that and it's really having effects in in releasing these criminals and by the way rodney reed's going to the supreme court like mm. to, to see if he can get an appeal and i would just ask people if rodney reed didn't rape and murder stacy stites then why does his semen keep ending up in women that were raped yeah, like I know. Five of them, including a 12 year old. What a, a coincidence. What a coincidence. Um, anyway, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, this has been such a good conversation. And I did want to tell the audience that I am having Atheism is Unstoppable on my channel, hopefully next week, uh, to talk about a case. Um, yeah. And this is Sean, Actual Justice Warrior. His links are below in the link tree. And thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Bye, guys.